so when they approached me and said, you know, we should do an anatomy and physiology boot camp, um, I thought, yes, that's a great idea. Like, I'm envisioning a week-long, you know, workshop where we're doing things and the students get feedback and there's lots of lots of activities and, and then I found out it was an hour thing like a couple weeks ago and I was like oh <laughs> so they say this is boot camp but this is not boot camp um, I'm just gonna say it's um, some advice on how to perhaps succeed and thrive in this class um, <coughs> It's a tough class. Everybody on campus kind of knows A&P is, is, is tough. And when I, when I came up with this list of things, I was thinking about the student who really struggles with the class who has walked in with basically nothing. Uh, and I don't know that that's necessarily you, but I was just envisioning this, okay, what kind of student has really kind of no preparation for what they've signed up for. So some of the things that I talk about may be things that you're already doing, you already have an idea of, and that's great. Um, but maybe I have some things to talk about that are new for you to, to consider. So one of the things that I wanted to start with is your fundamental motivation. There are students who really struggle with the class because they don't know why they're here. Um, they, they're, they have this sort of vague idea they're going to become a nurse because it's a good job, it's a good paycheck, benefits, blah, blah, blah. But they don't really have a, a connection to, to their goals. And, and the way that you need to really think about this, and I think everybody should, whether they're going into nursing or whatever, whatever field, whatever path they're going to take, we all really need to have a very firm idea about what our big picture goals are. What do you really want in life that is going to make you happy or content on a day-to-day -day basis? What do you really need to happen in your life so that at the end of your life you can look back on it and say, I'm satisfied with how I, how I lived my life, with what I did with myself. And so these are big picture things like, I want to have a family, or I want to live in the French countryside, or whatever the things are that you think about, like, you know, when you hear people talking about it, you think, I want that too. You know, so that's something you should set aside some time to do periodically throughout your life. What are the big picture things you want? And because nobody's going to give you those things, probably, um, you're going to have to work for them. And you have to figure out what you're willing to do in order to get those big picture goals that you want for yourself. <coughs> Excuse me. So then you need to figure out what the smaller goals are going to be that will lead you towards those bigger goals. And then you need to figure out your day-to-day -day tasks that support those smaller goals. And because there are going to be days where you're busy, you're tired, you're sleep deprived, maybe a little cranky, hungry, and you have studying to do because you've got an assignment, you've got a test coming up, and maybe your motivation is flagging a bit, it happens to all of us. That's the moment where you need to kind of touch base and say, oh, I have to do this because this is going to allow me to pass a &P because that's going to allow me to get into the nursing program, because that's going to allow me to be a nurse, and I've always wanted to do to be a nurse, or whatever thing it is that you're doing. You have to check in every now and then and kind of find that, reignite that motivation. Um, so that may be something you already do, or you have a general idea, but it might be a good idea for you to sit down and like write out, what's my big goal, what do I really want? Or make a Pinterest board. For it. Um, that's a great use of interest. So, you know, and that's something you want to check in with weekly, even daily, to figure out, like, this is what I want and this is why I'm doing this. And you may change, you know, years <coughs> go by and you say, I thought I wanted this thing. I thought I wanted a villa in the French countryside and I realized I hate everything about France. I would never say that, but um, 
But you know, you have to figure out like, oh, it's okay if you change your mind on some of those goals and recognize like, oh, I need to move that over here or put something else there. You should be checking in with yourself on those kinds of things. Um, every single week, you should sit down and think about what your schedule is going to be, what weekly tasks you have to get done that will support these bigger goals. <coughs> So you need to set aside that time every single week, like maybe make that be a Monday morning thing or find a day where you, you can be kind of relaxed Sunday afternoon. Just set aside that time. What do I have to do this week and how does it support my big picture goals? Um, the other thing <coughs> that I want to add, and this is stuff like you probably already know this, but I thought I'd emphasize it anyway. There's a connection between your brain and your body. Your brain is your body. It's made up of cells. You're this far in the class, so you know everything is made up of cells. And But we tend to think of our mind as being something separate, and it absolutely is not. For you to be a good student, you have to take good physical care of yourself. So that means eating well. That means you can't eat Chick-fil-A every day and expect to have a good uh, brain and body. You're going to have to find nutritious foods to eat. Um, and for every person, that's going to be a little different. We all have different biologies, different chemistries. So, you know, figure it out. There should probably be some fruits and vegetables in there somewhere. It's not Chick-fil-A every day or McDonald's every day, whatever it is. Um, and another thing that is that has been shown to promote academic success, in addition to lifelong health, is physical ex exercise or physical activity. And it doesn't really matter what you do so long as you do it. Is it walking, is it dancing, is it lifting weights, is it swimming, whatever it is, it turns out that academic success is very tightly correlated with physical activity. And so you might think, well, I really need to study, but it turns out sometimes doing physical activity can actually stimulate your brain in ways that studying won't. So if you don't already have an exercise plan, figure it out. Add that to your weekly tasks because people do better. And point of fact, if you give people um, a test, people who do 10 minutes of an activity before they take the test versus people who sit there and like cram for 10 minutes, the people who go do physical activity do better on the test than the people who cram. So do some jumping jacks before your next test. Maybe go for a walk around campus. Um, Sleep, particularly as you get older, particularly if you have children, not nearly enough time. And I, I struggle with this, and I know better, but I stay up late knowing I have to get up early the next day. We really should be striving for seven hours. And, you know, it, in, and by sleeping that much time, we actually improve our physical health and our mental health and our academic performance. This is another one of those things that you think, oh my gosh, I need to study for this test all night long. Like I'm going to stay up for as long as I can keep my eyeballs open and study and study and study. But it turns out if you go to sleep and you get quality sleep that night, you'll do better on the test than if you stay up all night and cram. So sleep is actually really critically important. I don't know if you know this or not, like our, our current goal on campus right now is the um, the writing center, the building better writers. And that's going to go on ostensibly for the rest of CVCC's life. Like that's an improvement program. I kind of feel like CVCC's next campus improvement program needs to be like CVCC goes to sleep. CVCC <laughs> gets a good night's sleep. Like that's what our program should be. Try to figure out how you're going to get good sleep this semester because it's going to show up in your in your test scores. Believe it or not, there's scientific proof of that. Um, so again, you know, going back to you know your weekly plan, fit these things into your weekly plan. If you know, like, if if you don't pack a lunch, you're going to end up at Chick Fil A. Spend some time on Saturday or Sunday and put together some. Uh, some meals, like you know you're going to need a sandwich on a couple days because it's just so busy, or put together a salad, keep it in your fridge. So, so build this into your, into your weekly plan, how you're going to take care of your physical health so that it takes care of your, your academic abilities. <coughs> Another thing that I see students struggle with 
is that they don't have a daily habit. Truly at our core, what defines who we are and what determines how successful we are is what we do every single day. You can't save up and have a special day where you really do great performance and expect that to build your life. You build your life on what you do every single day. It's a daily habit. Um, thinking about like, the, if you have a dentist appointment coming up, you can't brush your teeth like a hundred times the day before you go to a dentist and expect to get a good report. You have to have a daily habit of brushing and flossing your teeth. And so that's true with every single other aspect of your life. It's what you do every day. Um, what I find students kind of struggle with is they don't have that mentality of doing this on, a, on the daily. Um, I do see students who on the regular are experts on social media. That's great, like I'm not saying cancel your Twitter, cancel your, your Snapchat accounts and your Instagram accounts, but maybe when you're kind of scrolling through those apps, pause and ask yourself, is this the thing that I want to be an expert on? What you're going to be an expert on is what you do every single day. And a lot of students will save all their expertise moments until the night before a test. You want to build that expertise every single day. So you're going to try to find a way to study every single day. It may be that, oh, you only do it six days a week. And that's OK, because you had a busy day. Try to find an hour a day as your baseline, finding it one hour each day. If you can't find an hour, find 15 minutes. If you can't find 15 minutes, you have to ask yourself what, what it is that you really want. Um, people who are transforming their lives, which is what essentially you have proposed to do. You've signed up for this class. You're transforming your life. If it's important to you, you will find five minutes here, 15 minutes there, 30 minutes in another place. You'll cobble together little moments throughout the day to build that hour, even if you don't have a solid hour to sit down and study. Try to find those moments in time. But if you can carve out an hour every single day or almost every single day, that's going to build a habit for success. And that's kind of your baseline goal. You may find that you're not quite getting all of your, meeting all of your goals if you're putting in an hour every day. Some people need more, some people need a little less. And what you're gonna do is you, you can check in with yourself every week, are you meeting your goals? You can also use your test scores as your, your sort of thermometer. And if, if you are not reaching your goals, then you be your own thermostat and reset what your activity is going to be. If you need more time, find it. So the other thing for you to consider is, is mentors. And an obvious mentor who can help you create success is your AMP instructor. They know what's going to be on the test. They know how they test. They know the depth of information that you're supposed to know. And they want you to do well. So that's, a, that's an obvious person you can go to to get advice and to get help and you know, knock on their door, send them emails. Another mentor would be somebody who's taken anatomy and physiology in the past, somebody who took it last year or two years ago. They've been through this class, and if they passed it, then they've got quite a few tricks up their sleeve. They have a lot of ideas about resources you can use that might help you succeed. So that's something for you to think about. Keep your eyes and ears open. Who else went to CVCC? Who took A&P um, last year or the year before? And then another mentor for you to seek out is keep your eyes and ears open for people in your class who really know what's going on. Uh, if they're doing well on their tests, and I'm not necessarily saying you should go around and be a grade bully and like ask people like, what'd you get on your test? Did you get an A? I need to know. Like, but you know, people talk. There's, it's kind of obvious who really gets what's going on in class. Hang out with them. Talk to them after class, 
and ask them what they do because they may have some secrets as well about you know what they what they're doing to study maybe they found a website that's really useful or maybe they have some unique strategy of color coding their notes or whatever that might be helpful to you um, be nice but ask them that's that's what peers are for and don't be afraid of being that peer don't be resistant to being that peer but you also have <coughs> excuse me you have non-human mentors that are available to you obviously your textbook you spent a fair amount of money to get that textbook well, ostensibly you're using it um, that's one resource um, but another mentor for you would be books written by professionals in your field how many of you have read books written by nurses there's a couple of you have nurses write books nurses save lives but they also write books and that can be incredibly motivating it can give you insights into how you should think about problems so that's something for you to seek out and I've, I've read a few books so if you shoot me an email um, I, I can I can point you in the right direction but you can also look this stuff up on your own um, you should also think about podcasts do you any I, I know that's like a my generation thing do people still listen to podcasts old people do do young people do the young <laughs> listen to podcasts a few of you do there are podcasts in the field of health and that's another thing for you to listen for listen to because again it may not give you the answers that you need on exam number three but listening to those people talk about what they do can give you information or it can give you insight into how you should think about the world so um, check that out if you want if you don't that's okay too um, and then also you can check out articles there are always articles written by various health professionals that again it gives you insight into the problem solving into case studies into <coughs> adventures and problems and controversies that are in the field and that can be very useful in sort of training your brain how to think um, nobody is born knowing how to actually study um, your professors your instructors are constantly telling you you need to study you need to study you were told to study when you were in elementary school and high school um, but it's not any, it's not something that you're just going to be born knowing how to do like you can figure out how to walk you can figure out how to study through trial and error a lot of what people think is studying is incredibly passive and it's incredibly wasteful um, it's not an effective way to study um, there is some memorization that you're going to be doing in this class you're going to need to name all of the bones you're going to memorize lists and that's not particularly complex mental processing it's just straight up memorization there are some tricks you know you're going to be writing things down you're going to be talking about things you know so there are some tricks to that but that's not the complex learning that goes on here some people struggle with the memorization some people struggle with the conceptual learning usually a per, you know everybody is either one kind of thought or the other occasionally I have a student who's really good at memorization and they're really good at conceptual learning but that's a pretty rare student so you know if you find like oh I'm really good at memorization great play to your strong suit but then you need to figure out how to compensate with conceptual learning if you're really good at the conceptual learning that's fantastic play to that but then you need to figure out how you're going to memorize those piddly details all those names of bones and so on conceptual learning is really the foundation for most of what we do in anatomy and physiology uh, is there a chair somewhere over here maybe there you go so conceptual learning is where you look at the big picture and then you have to look at the details so you have to know you're looking at a forest then you have to know that you're looking at a tree and then you have to know that you're looking at a leaf at a stem at an ant that's crawling up the bark of the tree and so it's details in a larger concept uh, context so you have to be able to do both of those things um, and, and there's a lot of ways to go about that 
Uh, but, but conceptual learning is, is the more complex level of thought. To get to that level of complexity, you have to do active learning. You can't just sit and passively read and reread your notes. How many of you have sat down and tried to read your textbook just like reading it, like turning a page and reading it? Did you fall asleep? And how fast did that happen? Like really quick. Like I might actually have that as a problem. It's a little dry. In order to get that information, you have to do something that turns your brain on. Active learning means that you're kind of making your brain sweat. And that's the only way I can think of as describing it. Is you want to make your brain sweat. You've got to be active and you've got to be challenging yourself. So there, there are three phases that I think of with studying. There's what you do before you come to class, there's what you do during class, and then there's what you do after class. And in the first phase, that's the sort of preparation phase. This is where your goal is to get some passing familiarity. That you're going to crack open your book and you're going to skim through. I can go ahead and tell you, I, I mean I'm pretty sure this is going to be true for all the classes, particularly I can guarantee you it's true for my class. When we get to the organ systems, you know how they if you looked already, there, <coughs> excuse me, the, the first section of the chapter is anatomy. That is a total snore fest. Do not read that part. Skim through it, look at the pretty pictures, but then flip to the part that's on physiology. How does the organ system work? That's the part that you want to skim through. And as you're skimming through, look for the big words, the highlighted or bold words. Um, look at the headings and look at the figures. The most expensive part of your textbook is the figures. Your professors, your instructors are most likely going to be pulling those figures up and showing them to you on a PowerPoint. The first time you see it, you're not going to get it. Um, and I can say that with, with absolute humility of being a student. The first time I see something new as a student, I never get it. But I also have learned, I've gotten very comfortable with being able to say, wow, I do not get this, but I know I'm going to reread it. I'm going to see it in a different context, and it's going to click the second or third time I look at it. You want that first time that you're confused about it? Like, don't you want that to be before you come to class? So that when you're in class, you can have that, oh, I get it. It's that second time you've seen it where it starts to make sense. Have that uncomfortable, I don't understand any of this. Try to have that moment be before you come to class, at home, where you can be like comfortable in your pajamas, maybe with a hot cup of cocoa or tea. Like You want to have that uncertainty moment sort of in a safe space. Maybe you casually outline that section of the chapter, that physiology section. You know, and I'm not talking about a detailed outline like you would turn in for an English class paper, um, but just you know, write some notes as you're going through the chapter so you don't fall asleep. Uh, or you highlight. <coughs> um, and, and really and truly, do not panic because you don't understand it. You are absolutely not going to understand it. I actually might be a little nervous if you did understand it the first time you saw it. Um, so that's sort of, that's one stage, like if you can do this before you come to class, you're going to be really well equipped for class. And that's true for both lecture and lab. Um, the second phase is what you actually do during class, what you're doing during lecture, what you're doing during lab. Um, hopefully you're taking notes. I'm assuming you're probably doing that already in your classes. And the deal is that first set of notes that you're writing, that's a messy set of notes. It is not your final draft of your study guide. It's your first draft. There's going to be abbreviations. You're going to have really scratchy drawings, hopefully. You're going to have phrases that you don't immediately recognize when you reread them. Your, those notes are going to be very messy. Um, and, and you're going to revise that in the third phase. You're going to make a really beautiful final draft of a study guide mm -hmm. later on. So what you're going to do during this phase while you're taking those really messy notes is that you're going to hopefully start making connections. The words that tumble out of your instructor's mouth, 
it won't just be Greek and Latin to you. You'll be like, oh, I read that. I saw that before. And some of those concepts will start to mesh together. You'll see that there's a leaf attached to a stem. You'll see that the stem is part of a tree. You may not get the whole vision of the forest, the whole vision of how nervous system physiology operates, but you'll start to see the connections. It'll start to make sense. Um, so, and the other thing that I would encourage you to do is find some way to be a participant. I actually am an incredibly shy person. I'm also a very good actress, and that's why I'm able to do my job. Um, when I'm an actual student and I don't have to do this thing, um, I, I do not. I'm not raising my hand. I'm not standing in front of the class talking. Uh, when I'm in, when I'm being a bit more myself, I. I don't participate in a very obvious way, but there are ways you can participate, either as an, <coughs> as an extroverted person, meaning you're raising your hand, you're asking questions, you're answering questions, you're making comments, um, or you might do that in your own notes. You know, have that, you know, if you don't want to ask a question in front of everybody, write the question in the margin in your notes. Ask somebody after class or ask your professor. Um, get some discussion going, make it participatory, think about what you might ask. Um, so that's the second phase. Third phase is where you're, that's where real learning occurs. And this third phase is where you are your own teacher. You know best what works for you. Um, or if you don't, that's something you're going to be figuring out, I hope, very soon. Um, as a student, in the role of a student, I have figured out that I need a picture, I need to read something, and I need to hear something. I've had classes where I only have one or two of those things, and I never have enough, so I seek something out. So I've taken a class where all we did was read. There was never anything to listen to, and there were never any pictures. All we did was read, and it was a little bit brutal, and so I had to go and find something I could listen to. I had to go and find a picture that I could draw myself so I could see the concept. This is where you, you know, I knew that about myself because I've been a student and an instructor for quite a long time. You are going to be figuring that out if that's something you don't already know. If you need something additional from your study guide, from your notes, from your textbook, fine, fine tune. You know, figure out what that thing is that you need to do in order to get to your goal in this third phase, which is mastery. For all of your class, for all of your sections, you should have a set of objectives. All of the instructors at CVCC for AMP use a list of objectives. They're common across all the classes. And so, as you're figuring out if you've mastered each objective, um, you know this. You're you're going to be rewriting answers using your notes. You're going to use your textbook. You might even go online and seek out other resources. Wikipedia is actually pretty good at this. Um, use it, don't use it for your English papers, but the science stuff on Wikipedia is actually pretty well curated. Um, take it with a grain of salt always, but don't be afraid for this class. Um, so one of the things you can do with these objectives is you can think of the objectives as your own copy of a take-home test. And so if you're going to do this take-home test and you're answering the objectives, you're going to be writing out a couple of sentences or maybe a paragraph to answer each objective. And to do that, you're going to use your lecture notes because the notes are going to inform you how much detail does your professor want you to go into. Like, how deep do you go? Is this a superficial, like, did they spend two minutes talking about that concept? Or did they spend 30 minutes talking about it? And that's gonna, and you're gonna have the pages in your notes. So if they spent 30 minutes talking about something, you know you're probably gonna need a couple paragraphs to write out that answer. And if they spent two minutes, you can get away with a sentence or two, obviously. So you use your notes not only for the information, but to tell you how far into detail you need to go. Your professors don't. I mean, we love to talk, but we're not gonna talk in class unless it's something you need. Um, so you're going to be writing these out, writing out answers, and then the other thing I would tell you to do is to find a way to get feedback on your answers. 
have somebody in the class. Hopefully you have a peer in the class. Maybe you meet up and you compare your answers. Or you teach your answers to that other person, or you take turns teaching to each other. This is one of the dirty secrets of teaching. By teaching, you learn. And you learn far more deeply by teaching somebody else than you do by passively receiving. Um, and that's how your instructors know stuff, is because they've been teaching it. They know it better than anybody because they have to stand in front of a group of people and explain it. It's different. Knowing something well enough to take a test and knowing something well enough to explain it to somebody else are two very different levels of, of knowledge. And being able to explain it and communicate it to somebody else is really, really deep. So if you can teach somebody else at this level, you're going to be golden. <coughs> so having a peer to talk about your answers with, whether you're teaching or asking or quizzing one another, that's an outstanding way to reach your goal of mastering the objectives at this stage. Or finding a way to test yourself, like you've created your perfect study guide, you've written out the perfect answers, put that away, come back to your objectives and see if you can write the same thing without anything in front of you. Make your brain sweat. This is where you're going to really sweat. It's going to be really uncomfortable. Can you do this without, without a net? Um, all right. So going back to the idea that this is a daily habit. When you sit down to do your weekly schedule, sit down and think about, OK, what day am I going to skim the chapter and make a little outline? You know, like if you know your first class, if your lecture is on Monday, maybe you do that skimming on Sunday. Um, if your lab is on Monday, maybe you do the skimming on a different day. But figure out what your, your class schedule is and then come up with a little weekly plan. So you have one day where you're doing that skimming, skimming to prepare, and then three days working on objectives, another day to review lab to get ready for anatomy, and then another day to meet up with a peer. And then on the seventh day, I suppose you can rest, or on the seventh day, that's your catch-up day, whatever you didn't accomplish during the week. So figure out what your schedule is going to be. Like literally sit down and say, OK, this is what I'm doing on Monday. This is what I'm doing on Tuesday. If you make a plan for it, you're going to do it. If you just say, I'm going to do it, that's just a wish and a hope. And who knows if that's going to actually happen. Um, it's, it's better if you write it out and have this weekly plan. So that's a suggested schedule, but obviously you're going to tweak it for your, your schedule. There are some additional resources that either I've found over the years or my students have talked about. One of them is a series of videos on, on YouTube called Anatomy GMC. You just, just put that in the Google machine, Anatomy GMC. It'll take you to this series of videos. They're really long. <laughs> uh, I've listened to a couple of the lectures and watched. I found it to be a snore fest. But my students like it. And so, and they found it really helpful. And the woman who gives these lectures, she's not wrong. She's right. She's giving good information. It's just, uh, I thought it was really boring. Because you already know it. So. <laughs> because I already know. Yeah. Um, the another series of videos that I absolutely adore, um, it's called Crash Course. Um, if you guys know the author, now I can't remember his name, Green. He wrote Paper Towns. It's his brother. At any rate, this guy is a science teacher. No, he, yeah, he's a science teacher. But he has a whole series of subjects. And he actually did a series of videos on um, anatomy and physiology. He talks really fast. So if you're watching his videos, what you can do is kind of pause every now and then and absorb and then play. But he's very entertaining. He's very witty and very charming. And he does a great job with these little videos. Another one, I'm actually kind of afraid to put this up here because this woman is outstanding. I want to be her. It's Marion Diamond. She teaches at UC Berkeley. She teaches the anatomy class for medical students. And it's like, don't let that intimidate you. She's really exquisitely good at what she does. And so this is something you can, you know, 
put in, you can Google her name and find her on YouTube. She's also on iTunes uh, University, iTunes U, if you want to go that route. Uh, so that's, she, she does a little bit of physiology, but mostly what she covers is anatomy, but it's very good. And if you sit through her lectures, you're going to be very well prepared for class if, if this speaks to you, if this is something you find useful. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Some of you have Wiley Plus, not all of you. We don't all use it. It, it costs more, so if somebody's not, if a professor's not using it, um, they're not going to select it. But if you have Wiley Plus, there's a couple of things on there to use, and that is there's a tab called Read Study Practice, and that can be very useful. You can select certain topics. So, like, let's say in the cell biology chapter, you're totally solid on organelles. Like, you got it. You understand what a mitochondrion is. You're good. But you don't understand. Um, transcription and translation, you can find that tab in Read so, so you can pull down that topic in the Read Study Learn, and it'll take you through some little videos, little tutorials. If you don't have Wiley Plus, there are other tools on the internet that can take you there, but if you have the Wiley Plus uh, that came with your textbook, um, I encourage you to check that out. Orion is another tool. It, it's similar but different. Orion is going to take you through the whole chapter. What's kind of neat about Orion is it's called adaptive learning, which basically means that if you get answers right, it'll advance you to something more complicated. And if you're getting questions, if you're answering questions wrong, it'll keep you in that topic area until you get that, that topic mastered, and then you'll proceed ahead to the next topic. So it's kind of useful, it's kind of interesting, but it takes you through the entire chapter, and you may not necessarily need that. Um, there are podcasts. Um, so <coughs> if you like listening to things, there are people who have recorded lectures in physiology, and so you can listen, like while you're driving, if you have a commute. Anybody have a long commute? No, you guys are all in townies, all townies? All right, but if you're washing the dishes or whatever, if you've got time to like listen to something, if you're oriented towards that, like if you like hearing somebody tell you a story, there are podcasts where people can tell you the physiology story. Um, and that might help you kind of get more confident, more comfortable with the information. Um, and then there's a bunch of people who have recorded their classes and put them on iTunes University for free. So you can watch lectures and listen to people. And, and they'll give you a different version than what you're getting in class if you want that additional help. There are a ton of apps. The apps tend to be more, uh, more for anatomy. So you can do like little flashcards to learn the bones or little flashcards to learn um, muscles and things like that. Um, and then there are also apps for pronunciations, which can be really helpful. Like you, that if you're more confident with how words are pronounced, you're more likely to use them, you're more likely to spell them and get them right on the test. So you know, be 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 open to using apps, not just for Pokemon Go or whatever it is people are doing this week. Um, look for apps that are rel relevant to anatomy and physiology. Have any of you done this yet? Look for apps. What apps are you guys using? Silence. It's because the video camera's on. All right. Um, tell me after class if you want. Um, so apps are useful. And then another thing, there. <coughs> There are additional study guides, and one that I know of exists in the CDCC library. So you don't have to buy it. Just go to the library and check it out or see what else is on the shelf next to this. It's, um, I mean, I hate to say this because I don't think you guys are dummies. I don't think my students are dummies. But you guys know the book series, the blah, blah, blah for dummies, tax accounting for dummies, buying a house for dummies, anatomy and physiology for dummies. It's actually a pretty good study guide. So if you find your textbook to be a little too dense and a little too much of a snore fest, this breaks down the information so it's a little more digestible. And you can maybe you know, go through the study guide and then look at your textbook and it'll make more sense to you. So you don't have to buy anything. There are, there are study guides in the, in, the, in the library if you want to use those there. 
if you do want to buy one, these don't cost that much. It's, you know, 14 bucks, probably 12, 11, if you go, go on Amazon. You could probably go to a used bookstore and get it for five bucks if you know what you're doing. So um, that's another resource that I've, I've had students use this or something similar to it. Um, what else? Test taking. So another, another thing that, uh, that's not on the handout, so this is, uh, what do we call it, Lanyard? This is what we call it in Louisiana, Lanyard. Uh, thank you for coming. A uh, little extra. So one thing for you to think about when you're taking a test on a multiple choice question or a matching question, there will be multiple answers that will be correct, but one of them is more specific. It's a better answer. Pause on those questions when, you, when you're selecting from a list of things. Choose the best answer. Ask yourself if this is the best one. Go through your list, because it might be that you've got two things that are correct, but one of them is more correct than the other. Um, so that's on, <coughs> that's kind of a critical thinking thing, is figuring out like is this, a, this is correct and this is correct, but one is more correct. That's critical thinking. Another thing for you to consider when you're doing uh, a, a question, when you're answering a question where it's uh, like a short answer or an essay, um, you need to write in complete sentences. You need to convey a complete thought um, because a lot of times students will, on, on the, here's this big white space on the page and they'll write a list of three or four words. And those three or four words kind of answer it but it doesn't really convey that the student is knowledgeable. So don't be afraid of writing. We're not grading you the way your English professors are gonna grade you on your writing, on your style and form and use of adjectives. But we do want to have a complete meaning, a complete thought conveyed. So do write uh, complete sentences, do write paragraphs. And for my test, and I can't say this is gonna be true for everybody, but you know, if, if I'm asking a, a, a question and it's worth 10 points, I'm looking basically for 10 different pieces of information. And, and I think that's going to be fairly true across the board, but if you're, if you're being asked for, you know, if it's an eight point question, make sure it's an eight point answer. You're not going to get all of your points if you write one sentence. That's not enough information to justify eight points. Um, I've had a lot of students where, you know, it's like here's this big white piece section on the paper and they write very little and they don't understand why they're not getting all of their points. <laughs> what they wrote was correct but it wasn't complete. So write and sometimes if you know more than what the question is asking, write more. We like show-offs on the test. We love to see that sort of thing. So that's where, you know, whenever you write a sentence, ask yourself why. Like why is this true? And, and, and that might give you a, a way to get to that fully 10-point answer, or even make it a 12-point answer. Who knows, maybe you'll get two more extra points if you write a 12-point answer for a 10-point question. The other thing to do is that you might want to reread what you've written. Make sure you've actually answered the question. I don't want you to overthink your answers and, and, and um, sort of second guess yourself, but take a moment and pause and really think about if you've actually answered the question. Um, because very often we'll read something very different from what's actually on that paper. I know I do that with emails. Somebody sends me an email and I think they've asked me one thing and I answer their, the question I thought I read, but it doesn't actually answer what they asked me. So I try to pause when I send emails um, and try to do the same thing when you're writing. Pause. Are you actually answering that question? The other thing for you to consider doing is don't be afraid to write yourself little notes in the margin. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and there's a couple of tricks that you can do here. One thing you can do is if it's a multiple choice question, cover up the answers that are given and just read the question, 
answer it, write down what you think the answer is in the margin or maybe on a scrap piece of paper. Remove your hand and see if your answer is in that list. You can also use that scrap piece of paper and you can use the margin of your test to organize your thoughts before you write that paragraph for that short answer or essay question. So if, you're, if, you, if you need extra paper, I'm pretty sure all of your professors would be willing to give you a scrap piece of paper so long as you turn it in with your test. But those are a couple things for you to do. Don't be afraid to just cover your test paper with writing. Um, that's everything on this page. I'll let you read this for a second. you with pen and paper and I'm actually really happy about that because uh, that kind of activity is supported by the research. When we write, whether it's taking notes, whether it's writing out our study guide, we code information in a way that's very different than when we type. We can type absolutely perfect notes, like you can get verbatim, if you're a fast, efficient typer, your, your instructor can give a lecture and you can type almost every single word that they say and you'll type it, but you won't have actually coded that information in your brain. When you write, you don't get as many words down, but you create a code as you're writing. And, and, and it's, it's a way of making your brain sweat. And so it does some of your stage three learning for you by actually writing versus typing. And that's, that's uh, borne out in research. Uh, there, there have been a number of studies looking at um, typing versus handwriting. And there was a follow-up study <coughs> looking at people who do shorthand which nobody learns how to do shorthand. This was something that people stopped doing like back in the 1960s, I think. Um, you're, you're well, no, <laughs> in the 70s. In the 70s, okay. A little bit longer than the 60s. People used to learn how to do shorthand. It was, it, it was a thing that people learned if they were going to be a secretary, people who were uh, journalists, you know, when they were taking notes, they would do shorthand, which was this stylized version of symbols. And, and so people can, can actually write almost verbatim what's being said with this weird symbolic language. And it turns out that using shorthand is the same thing as typing, and people don't code the information versus just writing regularly. So, um, so write because it makes your brain sweat. And the more you write, the more likely it is that you're getting to this code. There's something about how your, your hand learns the information and it travels up your arm and into your brain. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Um, so that's kind of the advice that I could think of, like if I had a room full of people to like shape. Um, that's sort of the things I was thinking. Do you have questions that you want me to answer, things you were hoping to get from this? or hoping to get out of it so you could go get a cup of coffee. Is there anything anything else? Professor Penrod, do you have anything you want to add? I think you do an excellent job. Oh, thank you. So a lot of this stuff, especially about active learning, I have a lot of students who just like to be able to look at a picture, and they, they, they look at the picture and not the main information. But it's actually the act of taking the information that you've been taught and then producing your own picture over and over again that actually gets you to learn the information. So that's a critical active learning component of, of how it lets students learn. Making yeah. your own study guide. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.